Welcome to the MYS Virtual Hangout. Here's your host, MYS Music Director, Raul Gomez. Good afternoon, Metropolitan Youth Symphony students, families, friends in Portland and around the world. Welcome to another edition of the MYS Virtual Hangout. And today we have not one, but two amazing guests, Emily Cole and James Shields from the Oregon Symphony are going to be joining us very, very soon. Um, I'm such a big fan of the Oregon Symphony and I've, you know, since I came to Portland uh, in 2016, uh, I have made so many friends in the orchestra and I love going to the concerts. I love when I get to work with, with them. Uh, I love when they come to work with MYS students, which they do regularly. And both James and Emily are regular coaches of Metropolitan Youth Symphony students. Um, before we call them into the show, I do want to remind all of you that registration is open for MYS for next season. Uh, all you have to do is go to our website, uh, playmys.org, and there are gonna, you're, you're going to find a big button that says register. And I want to encourage everybody to register early. You just get it done. And uh, auditions are going to be via video. There will be no live auditions. And you can send your audition starting on June 1st all the way to August 14th. But if you go ahead and register now, you'll get that step out of the way and you, you will get an email with instructions for sending your audition video starting on June 1st. That will also give you a head start preparing to send your audition, which will determine which ensemble you will be playing with next year. And if you are watching this and you're not currently an MYS student, uh, go to our website, check us out. We have 14 different ensembles. We have orchestras, we have bands, we have string ensembles, we have percussion, and a very, very wide range of uh, uh, levels of experience and age. There's a place for all of you at MYS. It's a really welcoming community where we uh, inspire students to excellence through music, and we use music to create joy and to uh, and students inspire one another, they challenge each other and, and uh, really uh, healthy and well-balanced ways. Uh, so registration is open, playmys.org, do it. Um, another thing I wanted to uh, just mention is that there are so many great artists and musicians currently creating content online and uh, post some videos of their performances, uh, doing live streams. Uh, it's very important to support all of these artists by, you know, watching and participating. Um, but those artists who are also um, creating content and doing this uh, as a way to generate income, uh, right now it's a great time to support those artists also in that way. Uh, the individual artists and also the organizations that they normally perform with, uh, the Oregon Symphony being a great example of this. And uh, when this is all over and things go back to normal, let's go out to concerts. Let's support our local performing arts organizations, uh, not only in music, but in all performing arts here in town. Uh, in Portland, we're very lucky to have such a rich ecosystem of performing arts organizations. Uh, I feel very fortunate to live in this town and to be surrounded by so much art and so many great people. So uh, tune into live, stre live streams uh, and then uh, you know support those artists and then go to concerts when we can all congregate again. Very happy to see uh, Tyler, a, uh, an MYS alum, uh, watching the stream on Facebook. Uh, so hey, Tyler. So let's go ahead and call uh, James and Emily. I think they're standing by, and uh, we will uh, hang out with them and uh, hear them also offer a short live performance. Here we go. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, hey, let me put you up. 
Yeah, I can see you and I can hear you. And let me put you up on the screen. And then you are. How's it going, you guys? Hey, how are you doing? I'm great. And let's let's get the really, really important stuff out of the way. Okay, yeah. let's talk about that uh, beautiful little baby you have on your lap. I know, he's the cutest. His name is Goober, and he is, um, he's wearing his bow tie for this special occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Just for you, Raul. <laughs> I, I was hoping he would dress up. Yes, he's ready. D didn't disappoint. So how old is Goober? Goober is two years old. We've oh. had for a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you guys got him together here in town? Or? We did. We adopted him from a just like a little rescue agency. And he was with a foster family. And we went to go see him. And then we went and so got him like the next day. <laughs> And here he is. Wow, and I think that's that's uh, that blue uh, suits suits him really well too. I think that's a great choice of color. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys have any other uh, uh, pets before you got Goober? You know, I hadn't had a pet since I was a kid. We had a dog and a cat when I was a kid, and then um, they were kind of irreplaceable in our family. So we that was it for. That was it for pets for me until Goober. How about you, James? I had a bunch of uh, snakes and lizards and all <laughs> sorts of stuff when I was a kid. But um, it's our first first pet together. So v Very cool. And are, are you – I know you lived in uh, New Mexico. Are you from New Mexico? No, I'm from Austin, Texas originally. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. And my okay. first job was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Got it. Okay, I guess you can, you can find snakes in, in, in both of those places. Okay. Um, so we, so you guys have been here in Portland, James. You got here when exactly? Uh, I started in, I believe it was 2016, September of 2016, um, and uh, before that, immediately before that, I was in. Canada and Toronto, Ontario, where I was playing clarinet in the orchestra for the opera company, the Canadian opera company uh, in, in Toronto. So I was there for five years. And before that, I was in New Mexico for five years. So that means this is your fourth season? Third. Your, your yeah. third season with the orchestra. How about you, Emily? How long have you been in Portland? I joined the orchestra in January of 2011. So I've been here quite a while. I came here... I just finished a master's program at the University of North Texas, which is kind of near Dallas, Texas. Um, and I, I, yeah, you did. Um, I grew up in Seattle, so this was kind of like a kind of quasi homecoming for me to move back here. It was kind of unexpected and it was very exciting. So your 10th anniversary as a member of the Oregon Symphony is coming right up. Oh, wow, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, do you do you feel like time has just flown by? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Especially, I, I would say, especially like the you know the last five years or so. I just it's just like that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And I want to ask you guys, of course, about your work with the Oregon Symphony, uh, but also about many other things you guys do here in town. Uh, you're both avid chamber musicians, and you're involved in all kinds of cool projects and. Um, initiatives but before we get into that uh you guys were kind enough to send us statements for each other to play the game we play on this show two truths and a lie and i'm so excited to do those with you guys because they're so good and because we have two we have two sets of statements to get through let's go and uh let's go ahead and uh, set up the first one now before we get into into more conversation so james you wrote three statements about emily two of them are true one of them is a lie so yeah. let's go ahead and uh put those up on the screen as you read them for uh, folks who are watching to vote for which one of these statements they believe is a lie so let's hear statement a so a and tell me if I'm reading the wrong ones because I can't see them. But um, 
Uh, during high school, Emily was lead alto saxophone in her high school jazz band. And uh, during COVID-19, the stay-at-home order, she's been inspired to uh, dust off her saxophone and work up her improv chops. Okay, so <laughs> uh, that's statement A, and it is now up on the screen. Let's hear statement B. So statement B. Uh, Emily attended an event centered around the creation of the world's largest root beer float. It made it into the Guinness Book of World Records. Did she sample some? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there it is. So statement A, alto sax. Statement B, uh, root beer float. And statement C. Generally a well-behaved and attentive student, Emily nonetheless, nonetheless got off to a rocky start uh, with violin lessons. Her first teacher, teacher's pedagogical style hit a little too close to home. It was her mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's up on the screen now. So if you're watching, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, uh, now is a great time to vote for which of these three statements you believe is a lie. A, B, or C. And now, let's, as, as we uh, let people vote, um, Emily, Let's go back in time and yeah. without revealing the answer about whether that last statement is true or false, let's go back to your beginnings in music and your journey through high school and to college and, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to do this without, without giving anything away for, <laughs> um, for the questions. Um, I, so I grew up in Seattle. I grew up in a pretty musical family. Um, lots of relatives playing classical music and jazz and um, lots of, you know, varied styles of, of music. Um, and I played um, in Seattle Youth Symphony for many years. And I also was very fortunate to attend a... Um, a high school in Seattle with a really great orchestra program. And um, I know that you had Joe Kai on, a, on a, a past hangout. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So Joe and I actually, we went to high school together. We went to Garfield High School um, in Seattle. So we, um, I was really fortunate um, growing up to be able to participate in some really Fine music program. They've got a great jazz program there too, don't they? They do have a great jazz program. <laughs> it's just, just saying. Um, <laughs> and then I went to a couple of different colleges for um, to study music. I spent a little bit of time at Rice University in Houston. And then I actually transferred schools. I transferred to the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Austin is just a couple hours away from Houston. And actually, interesting, interestingly enough, James's father was teaching at UT Austin at the time, but I had no idea because he was teaching in the astrophysics department, and I was not taking any astrophysics classes at that time. Um, so, that could have been a good uh, uh, potential lie. Uh, yeah. My dad researches black holes at the University of Texas. Yeah. Sounds a little bit far-fetched, man. <laughs> That's so cool, though. And, and, it's really cool. Yeah, I was about to ask if you guys crossed paths then at all, you being from uh, Austin and you being there. We never while. crossed paths there, but we kind of crossed paths with sort of in the community, mutual mutual friends and musicians. Um, and then I did my master's at University of North Texas, which is where I was before I moved here. So, um, yeah, I just kind of made my way north through the state of Texas very yeah. slow, and then came here. And did, that was you, my path. did you two meet here? We did. Cool. And how about you, James? What was your uh, childhood, teenage years uh, like in music? Um, so I grew up in Austin, Texas. Marching band was a big deal there, and music education was was pretty strong. And um, uh, you know, I had a great time being in band. And it's funny because all my friends were band nerds, and still to this day, most of my friends are 
my musical colleagues and so I'm really happy to have found that community and um, and uh, I went, out, went to school at, at, uh, at Juilliard for my undergrad um, got my undergrad in clarinet performance there and the next year I started with the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra in Albuquerque I was 22 and um, I also got a master's degree in composition while I was at the University of, uh, while I was with the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra. Um, partly just because, you know, I, I thought to myself, you never know what's going to happen. I wanted to make sure I had a master's degree um, just in case, um, you know, in case I wanted to go back and get a doctorate or something like that later. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'm really, really glad I, I'm really glad I did. The orchestra there um, was a bit of a smaller orchestra. We only rehearsed at night. A lot of people still had day jobs. And so it was pretty easy to go to, I, I don't want to say it's easy, but it was possible for me to go to school uh, at the same time. Uh, and I spread it out over a couple of years. I took a little longer to finish my degree just, just so that I didn't, didn't drive myself crazy trying to work and go to school at the same time. But, um, and then, like I said, I went to Toronto for five years and um, uh, 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 played with the opera company there. Um, I should mention when I was in New Mexico, I got involved with a chamber music group called Chatter, which um, does like 70 chamber music concerts a year, a ton of concerts, uh, and I'm still involved there. And uh, I love doing chamber music. And when I was in Toronto, I uh, made a lot of friends with with colleagues who love to play chamber music there. And um, you know, so I, I feel like I kind of have three communities of people. Four, if you include my some of my old friends from New York who who we play chamber music and. Uh, of course, we can't fly around and meet each other and play chamber music now, but at some point in the future, uh, I look forward to getting back to all those people. And did you also play, in addition to your high school band program, did you play in a youth orchestra growing up or not? Um, I did. I did, yeah. In, in Austin? I did, yeah, the Austin Youth, youth Symphony. Yeah. And let me ask you something. When you were in high school, James, so I find now with with students at mys and, and just high schools in in oregon that there are kids who play wind instruments brass percussion that are very much on a, on a band track yeah and they're not so interested in orchest orchestral playing yeah uh, was it similar in your case um i i would say if anything i leaned slightly more towards being interested in orchestra personally um i always wanted to do that I, I didn't dislike band at all. I liked doing everything. And, you know, sometimes now I wish I could play in a band again just for fun. But I was always more interested in orchestra, in chamber music, and kind of wanted, wanted to go that, go that route. Cool. Um, now, here, here's something I like to do right now. Um, people have voted already. Uh, we have a few uh, votes in both uh, YouTube and, and, and Facebook. But before we go into the performance that you guys uh, are going to uh, play for us, why don't we go ahead and reveal one of Emily's truths, and then we can we can talk about that for a little while, and then we'll go into the uh, performance. Uh, say one, one of the okay, so wait, I'm supposed to say one of the truths, or let's have Emily reveal one of one of okay. her truths. Okay. Um... In case it wasn't clear from, or it was made made clear by my sort of biographical, um, my musical story, family, my musical family um, my mom was my first violin teacher, and um, she, my mom is a is a professional violinist. She plays, still plays in the Seattle Symphony, and um, she was a, she's been playing there she's been playing there many, since before you were yeah since before i was yeah. born she's been there many years and she was a, a wonderful teacher but you know it's it can be difficult sometimes to get to get criticism from a from a parent in a like in a um in a musical context like she would she would say okay you, can you just move your third finger just a little bit higher and i would just start to cry and so that was kind of, that was kind of our that so, was our energy. <laughs> how, how long did you do that for? When did you get your first teacher that was not your mom? She was she was very very patient, um, and that was, so that lasted for about a year. And then I ended up studying with a colleague of my mom's, and um, and my mom has actually, you know, it's it's 
been really actually really wonderful to have a parent who plays the same instrument and that she it's something that we can talk about together and something that um i feel like she really understands the the difficulties and the joys and um but yeah as a, as a child it was you know it, it was it was not because she was extremely kind and patient it wasn't because she was you know being being super hard on me it was just hard to hear that but you know when I was preparing for orchestra auditions was when I actually really took seriously like starting to play for her because she she sat on many audition committees and I'd have to kind of te- temper my inner eight-year-old <laughs> when she would say okay this measure you need to not rush and make sure it's not out of tune and I have to okay yes <laughs> I felt my like inner child kind of come out and have to sort of express. Yeah, that's uh, my daughter is one year old, and I'm, I'm sort of terrified to teach her myself. Uh, not only because you know of whatever dynamic we might have with father daughter and her being I don't know, uh, but just that I don't I just don't feel qualified to t- to teach a beginner like a you know that's such a specific set of skills that you need to teach a total beginner especially when they're so young so it kind of i will probably well if she oh looks like we might have lost you guys for a moment let's see it should reconnect pretty quickly as it normally does but in any case i'll I'll keep just saying all of you who are watching that um if alma wants to play the violin i think we'll probably get a, a really like a specialized teacher to to get her started. Um, okay, so let's see if this sh- we might have to restart the Skype call uh, if it doesn't reconnect automatically. Okay, so let me just I'm gonna hang I'm gonna hang up and I'm gonna call back. Ah, okay, hey. you, you're back. <laughs> It's so good, yeah. Uh, I was just saying that I don't feel qualified to to teach my daughter when she gets to an age that she, you know, if she wants to play the violin because it's, it's such a specific set of skills that you need to teach a total beginner. And mm-hmm. I have so much respect for people who are really, really good at doing yeah, that. I do too. So. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we, let, let's transition towards your live performance that you're going to uh, gift us. Sure. So if you guys would introduce the piece uh, and just take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so we're going to play the uh, third movement of Mio's suite for uh, violin, clarinet, and piano. Uh, conveniently, the third movement doesn't have piano in it. So it's kind of become our uh, go-to shelter-in-place song, as I put it. (laughs) Let's see. Can you see both of us? Yeah. And uh, it's fun. It's kind of it's it's got two sections. Um, The first section comes back at the end. Uh, It's really joyous, boisterous piece. The second section is uh, a little quieter, a little more searching, a little more coy. And then again, uh, the the opening material comes back, and it's got a really really fun. ending it's got a certain kind of fiddle fiddle barn dance vibe to it at the end it's really cool it's very cheeky yeah awesome thank you
guys. Gooberd <laughs> likes to join in. I I was gonna say, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, 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 he Goober said this is a trio, and there must be <laughs> yeah, a third exactly. performer. They don't stay. It's the open E string. He, he really likes string. the open E string. Well, gets him going. That was awesome and beautifully played. What a fun piece. Yeah, it's great. It's super fun. Have yeah. you guys done the whole thing with uh, with the pianist, the other movements? Actually, the last time that we played the whole piece was right here in our house. We had a um, house party for the there there are organ symphony house party concerts. They're called Parties of Note, and we host one. Maybe in June. Yeah, it was it was last last summer. Cool. With it, we had a visiting cast from out of town, and we played that piece. And um, can't remember if Goober howled that time. But, uh, <laughs> that's a kind of newer thing that he did. <laughs> Sorry, Goober. Uh, I have a dog too. Her name is Jasmine. She's also little. She's somewhere in the living room. Uh, she howls too. Nice. So but only for about the first. Well. We used to have two. One uh, was older and is no longer with us, but the two of them together would howl for the first five minutes of, of my practicing every single time. Wow. It was really sweet. Um, cool. So th thank you for playing that, for sure. sharing that with us. I see that Goober found his uh, little bed or pillow back there. Oh, yeah. He, he needs to take a little break after the uh, performance. Yeah. Uh, it's understandable. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, Emily, let's go back to your uh, final truth here. Uh, but before you do that, uh, we did have uh, at least I'm seeing a cup three people who voted C as the lie, which means you guys were wrong. But you get you, you get a chance to change your vote because we're down to A or B. One of these is true. One one of the and the other one is false. So you can change your vote if you want. But Emily, let's go ahead and reveal the uh, second truth. Okay, the second truth is I did in fact attend the um, creation and distribution for drinking of the world's largest and that was in Seattle when I was, um, I think I was maybe in middle school oh. and I don't know, I, I went with a good friend of mine, I don't know how she found out that this was happening, but at the time I was obsessed with the Gibbs Book of World Records and I would always get one for Christmas, updated to all the, all the new world records and I really, I loved reading it for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. I was. It was just one of those like random, random obsessions I had. So going to this, I, I, I it was like the coolest thing I ever done. Do you know? Do you know if that record has been broken? That's a good question. That's a really good question. I'll oh, find yeah. out. How big was it? I mean, do you have it any? Was, it, so it was in a park in uh, in downtown Seattle, and they. I'm trying to remember what it was in. I think it was just in this big stainless steel tub. Tub. And I remember it was pouring down rain, and we were wearing ponchos, <laughs> like plastic ponchos, and waiting in this line to get like a little plastic cup of root beer float. And but I was just like, oh, this is I'm part of history. <laughs> That's such it's such a fun memory. I mean, it's awesome. And, yeah, and I remember it very vividly. So yeah. And how about uh, the lie here about you playing alto sax? Is any of that true or just absolutely no, false? Not, not a word of it. It's true. Okay. Like the Never played a jazz band. Can't improvise. No saxophone. Cool. None of it. <laughs> Very nice uh, curveball there from James when you uh, pointed out the, the good jazz program. Oh, Garfield, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so... Um, yeah, these are great. Thank you, James, for sending these statements about Emily. Um, okay, so let, let me uh, change the screen back to just get that out of the way. Uh, let's talk about the Oregon Symphony for a little bit. So, uh, James, you started in 2016, Emily 2011, and of course, unfortunately, currently, there are no performances, there are no activities with the Oregon Symphony, and we're all... Um, hopeful and uh, excited about next season. Um, but let, let's talk about your process getting into the orchestra. Uh, so, Emily, because you joined first, let's start with you. So, uh, w did you make it into the Oregon Symphony? Was that the first audition you, that you had taken for this particular orchestra? It was the first audition I had taken here. Um, 
And it was the it was the second uh, prof- like major audition that I had taken ever. I had taken my first audition ever earlier that year, and I really didn't play well at all at that audition. And I remember having this thought, man, I really need to. I have a lot of work to do. I've got to really buckle down. This this was kind of a wake up call. And, you know, I just kind of prepared myself to maybe have to go through taking auditions many more times after that. Because I really, I, it was in that first audition that I realized how different it is when you get into a, a room where you're playing your excerpts that you've just been practicing in, at home or playing for your teacher. And then you go in this room and it's like, it couldn't be more different. It just feels so weird. And so the preparation that you have to do is so, is different than like if you were preparing for a recital or preparing for an orchestra concert or a chamber music concert, it's just like a totally, totally different story. So, um, I, I was so lucky that I was successful the, the subsequent time that I went out and, and did that. Um, and I, it, I, you know, don't attribute that to me having kind of mastered the, you know, the audition process. It still is something that, I know it's. I, I've taken. I've actually taken auditions since then to kind of keep my skill set up. And um, every time, it's it's a reminder that there's always more. Um, there's always more to work on. And yeah, but I feel I feel really fortunate. And I remember how fortunate I felt uh, on at that time for having had such a lucky day. And how much time was there between those two auditions? <laughs> Uh, there was about uh, maybe seven or eight months or so. Yeah. What was your process similar, James, when you uh, came to Portland? Um, so for me, um, at that point, this audition here was probably like my 20th audition. Um, the first job I got was um, in the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra. Um, And that was my third audition. My very first audition was for the Vancouver Symphony in Canada. And a little did I know it, but Emily's uncle was behind the screen judging because he is, he was, he's principal oboe in that orchestra. Um, But I I had no idea what I was doing. I just wasn't well prepared. um, And just like Emily said, the experience is so different. Um, If you uh, are doing chamber music or, uh, have a symphony concert, you learn your part, but then there's also a period where you're rehearsing before you go out into public. So it's kind of the rehearsal period is another chance for you to get comfortable with what you're going to need to do. And, you know, you're, you're moving closer to that point where you're going to do it in public. But for an orchestra audition, you kind of go straight from practicing alone to performing alone. Um, and you have, you're missing that second step to like kind of get used to it, get the jitters out, which is why a lot of us, a big reason why a lot of us do mock auditions. We go play excerpts for friends. And I think a big part of that is just getting comfortable to what, it, to getting used to the experience of just playing through these things. And, um, it, it, you hold yourself accountable in a different way when somebody else is listening, even if they don't have a lot of tell you about how to do it differently you're just going to learn a million things in like the first five minutes that's when you go try to play for them so like i said um that was my first audition for vancouver symphony in new mexico was my third i felt really lucky that i got that one and then after that i took like 10 where i didn't get anywhere i just got eliminated immediately um and and that happens that's normal like if you're trying to get into orchestras there's a lot of really talented people who show up and it's, the competition is really steep, and you kind of have to be prepared for it not to work out. Admit, maybe a lot of times, I think Emily and I were both pretty lucky. So, um, and then I ended up getting my other job in Canada, in Toronto, right when the, my old orchestra in New Mexico was going bankrupt. Um, so we had some financial trouble there in 2010, and right around that time, uh, I was fortunate, and I got another job in Canada, um, and then. Uh, and then, yeah, then I wasn't really taking many auditions for a while, and I always wanted to live in the Northwest. So when this Oregon Symphony opening showed up, uh, I uh, I jumped to the chance. 
Nice. And, I mean, Emily, for you, not only was it your second edition, but also coming back to the Pacific Northwest as well. So that must yeah. have been pretty, a pretty incredible feeling. It, was, it really was, yeah. Yeah. And now, uh, you know, for you almost 10 years later, for you, James, four years into it, um, what are your... Let me see how I can ask this. When I go to an Oregon Symphony performance... I'm amazed by, I think, the chemistry of the of the uh, musicians on stage. And I know that you guys, uh, I mean, these are your colleagues, but, you know, these are also your friends. And, and I think that shows in, in the music when you go and you hear a concert. So w what are some things that you have found in the Oregon Symphony that perhaps you had not found before in other ensembles? Or what are the things, the things that keep making you, you know, want to come back to rehearsal every week? You want to go? I'm trying to formulate my, my thoughts. I mean, I think the way you put it, it's, it's totally true. I mean, the, the morale and the camaraderie in this orchestra is amazing. Um, and uh, everybody feels like friends and it feels like, it feels like a safe environment. Um, you know, uh, everybody really cares about the music and there's like 2000 people in the audience and it, it can be a lot of pressure. Um, and all of us have really good ears. We have really high expectations. And so we're all really critical of ourselves, but it's nice to be performing in an environment where it, it doesn't feel like everyone is critical of each other. Like we want the best because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to notice things that you wanted to go better, but it's really important to keep trying to play to take risks musically and to really go for it and not not get kind of tight. Um, so there's a freedom that's there when you know that everybody around you supports you and they're having there to have fun. It's, we're not necessarily everybody wants to keep getting better. Everybody wants to get the most of the music. But um, when it becomes too much about like perfection, it kind of works against the aim because you're never going to be perfect. The better you get, the more you're going to hear that you want to be better. And it's just a process. And so um, in order for that process to play out over time, um, you need that environment where everybody is is supporting each other, everybody um, is looking for the best in each other, um, and it, it really it's really fun. It makes it really fun to, fun to go to work. I, I almost never have a feeling like I don't want to go to work. Like pretty much every concert, like 99.5% of them, you know, um, there's the odd one where I'm, I'm feeling tired or just in a bad mood, but like the vast majority of the time, I, I, I'm really happy to go to work, go to rehearsal. And I mean, I, I'm so thankful for that. That's, it's really amazing. I also feel like the rehearsals are really fun. Yeah. Um, in the Oregon Symphony, people really, um, bring, they just bring a lot of energy, a lot of preparation, a lot of energy, but also like James was saying, there's not kind of that, that tension of people being afraid of um, making a little mistake. People really go for it, and um, we encourage one another to do that. And Carlos encourages us to do that. And just it, it, that kind of culture, group culture, makes for a really um, a fulfilling work experience. I mean, ideally, I, I always want rehearsals and concerts as well to feel like an exploration, not a test. Do you know what I mean? And so like, if you're exploring, like you don't know quite what you're gonna find. Um, you may need to like correct course a couple times. Um, but if you're taking a test, you're like trying to get everything right. And it's just, I, you know, I, I don't think that's the best environment for music, for, for making music in a way that, that is, is engaged and will, will like bring a, a positive energy to the, to the performance, to the audience. Yeah, and I think you know that chemistry and that what you're saying of, of this being a, a sort of a, a safe, supporting environment, then allows you as a performer also to, you know, to take risks and and, and be creative and and be daring. And a, a lot of times, the magic in a live performance comes from those moments of yeah. of, of risk and vulnerability. Yeah. That can only really happen if you're surrounded by people that you trust. Yeah. Right. And now, it is. 
evident that for all of you guys, it's it's not enough to play together in the orchestra because you're all involved in a whole bunch of other chamber music projects with your Oregon Symphony colleagues that also bring so much to the local performing scene. So what are some of these uh, organizations or concerts, events or projects that you guys ha have been involved with in the last few years? Well, in Portland, James and I have both been involved with, um, we're both uh, players in 45th Parallel Universe, which is Okay, so it, it says it's reconnecting. So let's uh, we'll just wait for a few more seconds, and if not, we'll call back. It's part of the live streaming game, everybody. This is what happens. The uh, internet gods. So okay, let's let's call back. It's all good. Here we go. Okay, we're back. <laughs> it's, I, was, I was talking and I, and I saw your face just like frozen, I was, <laughs> but I was like, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so good. It, I was saying it, it's part of the live streaming game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you were saying, you were talking about a 45th parallel universe yeah. and you got caught exactly after you said the word universe. So 45th parallel universe is a kind of a collective of a couple different small groups, a couple different string quartets. There's a woodwind quintet and a percussion ensemble. And we also play in a, an unconducted chamber orchestra together. Um, so we've done a lot of cool projects with that. Um, I've played as part of the Third Angle Ensemble. Um, James has played as part of Fear No Music. Um, I've also played in Adam Lamott's Amajay's Chamber Orchestra. And just there's, there's lots of, um, it's just been a really rich, chamber music life for us here in Portland. Uh, when I was on faculty at uh, Lewis and Clark, I played with the faculty there and, and for various concerts. So just lot, lots of stuff happening. There was a recent concert uh, by Third Angle that I unfortunately was not able to go to, but this was uh, with Carlin Shaw uh, mm -hmm. and uh, The Evergreen, I believe is what you guys mm -hmm. did. Uh, will you talk about that a little bit? That looked so cool, and I was so sorry that I missed it. That was a really cool experience. Cool doesn't even, it's not the appropriate word. It was something more than that, but that's the word I have to describe. Um, so, like a lot of kind of composers who are in demand with careers on the rise, of which Caroline is definitely one, um, they're often really... Um, coming coming up up against the clock with the deadlines, they've got to get this this piece to this group and this concerto to this person, and so we were waiting to receive parts from. I mean, we played some other music at first, but this premiere, we were waiting to get the parts, and we we got kind of some preliminary parts from her just a couple days before our first rehearsal, and she flew from New York to to be there for all of our rehearsals. So she came to the first rehearsal and we played what she had and she had her laptop the whole time. And in, in real time, as we were playing, she was in um, Sibelius or Finale or whatever program she was using and just typing away and adding stuff, adding dynamics, changing notes. Um, and then she'd have us go back and she'd have us try a couple different things, some different articulations and and she would she'd type away and she'd change it. And then um, that night she'd go to Office Depot, print out new parts, bring them the next day. And then the, the same thing would happen the next day. And we would play and she would type, 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 and she would have us kind of experiment with different things. And this process continued up until the day, pretty much almost the day of the concert. And um, it was really awesome to be part of the the creation of something totally new and to work that closely 
with the composer at that at that stage of the um, the composition process. That was unique to me, and to work with somebody like her, she's a um, really special musician and person. She is. Um, it was it was great to get to know her. And uh, we did a couple of things with her singing. She has a beautiful voice, and her vocal music is unbelievable. Um, for anybody listening that hasn't got a chance to listen to her part, she did for eight voices that she um, won the Pulitzer Prize for. Check it out because it's really, really awesome. So yeah, that was really um, there was a special week to spend with her. Especially kind of as things were starting to get more tense as far as the coronavirus and she's coming from New York where things are kind of, we're starting to sort of ramp up at the time as far as people getting um, a little bit stressed out. So it was just, a, it was kind of special to have that experience together right before kind of everything sort of went quiet. <laughs> yeah. And James, uh there was a concert by 45th Parallel uh, uh, called Le Boreard that you were pretty involved with. Uh, will you speak about your role for that concert and just the overall concept? Well, I mean, it was a really, it was kind of a, a roundabout way that we ended up designing the event that we did. Um, we had three concerts, chamber orchestra concerts scheduled for the season as part of 45th Parallel. Um, and a lot of the venues that were chosen where they fit the theme of the concert in one way or another. For instance, we we would have been playing a concert just a few days ago that ended up being canceled that, that was called BMW, and it was going to be played at a BMW dealership, and it had music by Brahms, Melinda Wagner, and Mendelssohn, and... Um, this program, the Borai, was a program of all French music, um, all the way back to uh, French Baroque music of Rameau. That was where the concert got its title. Uh, we played a suite of music from uh, an opera called Le Boreade, which was the final opera that Rameau wrote. It was never performed during his life. Um, a lot of really beautiful music. We played some more contemporary stuff, a piece by Pierre Boulez. Um, we also did uh, uh, works by Ravelli and Debussy. They were kind of representing the impressionistic school. And Ron, um, the executive director, Ron Blesinger of 40, uh, 45th Parallel, uh, was trying to find a French venue for this. And he couldn't find anything that was suitable. And he said, let's just make a virtual venue. So um, one thing led to another. It ended up not having very much to do with French architecture or anything at all. but we just, once we asked the question of how could we make a virtual space, it just things, one thing led to another and we got an artist, Brad Johnson involved and a, a media company, um, Glowbox, uh, had these scrims put up and they projected these images in really cool ways that were manipulated in real time. Um, and there were some interesting things that were done. Um, we uh, used images of Roman columns, but then kind of uh, uh, contrasted those with basalt columns, like volcanic um, rock columns that are from Oregon. And so there's a little bit of conversation between ancient Greece and then like volcanic history. And it, it was really fun. And we did it at, at Pika has a warehouse space that had really great acoustics. And we had everybody uh, standing around us and everybody could move around between movements and get a different perspective uh, on the performers who are performing inside this sort of box of, of screens uh, where these images were projected. And, and Pika, that's Portland that's Institute for Contemporary yeah. Art. Yes. 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 Cool. I mean, and if you go to the uh, 45th Parallel website, there's still the video trailer for that, and it just looks so cool. It's just so cool. Oh, and I, 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 I cannot wait to see what you guys in 45th Parallel will do next, you know, because we continue exploring the, those possibilities. Very cool. Okay, so, um, and then, of course, COVID-19 happened, and we are on what feels like week 50,000. Yeah. 
Uh, but before we talk about what you guys have been up to in the last few weeks, uh, let's do Emily's statements about James for our uh, two truths and one lie. <laughs> Uh, and if you have those, oh, let me see. Okay. Okay. So, um, whenever you're ready, Emily, let's read uh, statement A about James. Statement A: James used to play the violin, but he quit, not once, but twice, because it was too hard. <laughs> okay. So that's A, and it, it's up in the script. That's A. Okay. B. B. James was once involved with the founding of an organization called the Church of Beethoven. Okay. Church of Beethoven, that's B. Okay, and C. While in a uh, sheltered place, James has taken up a serious hobby, baking sourdough bread. <laughs> Okay, so that's up on the screen now. And uh, folks, if you're watching, go ahead and vote. Which one of these is a lie? Uh, and let's talk about, uh, you know, the last few weeks. What have you guys, uh, without revealing any uh, clues here about the uh, truths and the lies, what have you guys been up to? Um, we have um, been doing a lot of yard work <laughs> we're kind of trying to take advantage of this this time to kind of get caught up on various you know stuff that when we're when we have a heavy playing schedule we run out of time to pull dandelions out of the front yard and chop down um yeah i mean it was like a jungle. Was fine. it was like a jungle back there you know we've probably cut out you know 300 pounds of blackberry bushes and vines i've been yanking vines out of the trees i should probably be wearing a helmet when i'm doing that and and uh it's it's been fun we've, we've really kind of transformed it back there it's very therapeutic yeah it's really fun um i it took me a little while after we kind of went into shelter in place to feel i, I was i was really bummed about um all the canceled concerts as we all are and i just wasn't really sure what to do with myself and how am I going to use time and um, the first thing that I did was kind of take the opportunity to go through and kind of do a first learning of some of the chamber music that I was supposed to play during that time that oh, I'm really hoping I'll get a chance to revisit and then I went through my sheet music library and I pulled out a ton of music that um, I have always wanted to learn and maybe will plan to perform down the road things that I kind of, I just haven't got a chance to um, have the time to or opportunity to learn yet so I have a big stack of music and um, we take Uber on a lot of walks James has a lot of um, tell about your recording projects um, yeah I mean I, I sort of immediately jumped into various projects just because you know I like I like to stay busy and I think I think I'm gonna take a week off next week but uh, but, you know, I just know my personality and I tend to do better if I'm just kind of, you know, whipping myself along and, and staying busy. And so um, I did a couple things. Uh, I, I started posting a video every day on bass clarinet going through all the Bach cello suites uh, one movement at a time. And partly I just love that music. And um, I figured if I did, uh, there's six movements for every suite. So I'm doing one suite per week and I take a day off. And uh, uh, my last post for that is tomorrow. I'm almost done. And it's been really fun. It's it's never perfect. It never sounds quite as good as I want, but the, you know, it's something that it keeps me practicing every day. Um, Bach for me is like, kind of like the best um, etude is the way I, I view it in some ways that solo Bach because it has technical challenges. It has musical challenges. It's really fun to listen to. You find something new every time you look at it. Um, and, and so that's been really fun. I'm trying to go through the violin sonatas and partitas as well on clarinet, but they're like way harder and more awkward. And so I'm like, like super behind on those. Um, but I also started composing a little bit. Um, uh, I've composed on and off since middle school. Um, and, you know, I've always been so busy performing. I haven't
Okay, we're having uh, connection issues again. Let's see if it will fix itself. Maybe it will. Okay, let's go back just like before. Uh, and <laughs> Skype is asking me about the quality of the call. Okay, okay we're back. Where, where did you lose me? <laughs> so you've been composing on and off since middle school. Yes, and uh, I was just saying I'm really glad that I'm, that's that's not like my official career because it's there's something like about composing. It's like when it when it's going well and you feel like it's, you're writing something cool, it's so fun. But when it's not going well, it's like this weird mix of just like embarrassing and stressful and annoying and you're just like why am i doing this why am i doing this? so i'm kind of glad that i can step away from it and and focus on performing and i don't i'm not relying on that but um i haven't been writing much in the last couple of years and i've been missing it and i just said to myself you know if i'm not if i'm not gonna if, if i'm not gonna write something now you know we don't have kids we're like stuck at home then when am i gonna do it and so um i decided i would write a piece for clarinet and string trio and part of the reason i, I wrote for that group of instruments is is that I, um, I've been performing these um, these quartets uh, by a Finnish classical composer um, named Crusell, who's kind of the, one of the most famous composers before a uh, Finnish composer before Sibelius and I, I think they're really lovely pieces um, there are a lot of pieces for clarinet and string quartet Mozart Brahms Weber wrote these amazing pieces uh, but I like this this instrumentation with just the three strings and the one clarinet, I think it has a certain nice balance to it. Um, and so I wanted to write something that could potentially be programmed along with one of those pieces. Um, and so I started writing this piece. It's very crazy, hyper virtuosic, really fast. And I've been writing it kind of minute by minute and uh, in a way where um, it's, it's, uh, it's really challenging to learn, something fun to learn, but then it could be recorded and released kind of one minute at a time. And so just a couple of days ago, I had some colleagues, uh, including Emily, um, help me record this using the app acapella. Um, so I have a had a violist friend from the Edmonton Symphony, who I knew from my days in Toronto, and a cellist named Laura Metcalf is a freelancer in New York, um, who, who I've known for a long time. And we all recorded. It was, it was really fun. I was really happy with how it turned out. Cool. And we have that video queued up and ready to go. All right. So let's let's watch that right now. Okay, so here's is this the first minute of the piece? Yeah, a minute or so. Yeah. Okay. The tempo I originally set out to to write for was too fast. I couldn't even learn it at the tempo, so we had to slow it down slightly. I calculated it to be exactly one minute at a certain tempo, and it, it was just too hard. So it's like a minute and seven seconds or something. <laughs> so. Cool. Okay, so let's listen to that right now. Here we go. Cool. It's so funny because we couldn't hear anything here, and like, so it's just like really quiet and chill in our house. But I know like how crazy the piece sounds. So I'm like watching you listen to it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. I, I love it. How do you have a, a goal duration for the piece? Or yeah, it's gonna be about six or seven minutes. Um, and the idea is that like for um, for the first minute, it's all clarinet sixteenth notes the whole time. Second minute is all viola sixteenth notes. 
And then there's going to be two minutes in the middle where it's just like everybody passing back and forth craziness. And then it will be the fifth minute will be cello. And then the final minute will be, be the violin, violin craziness. So Emily's going to have to look out for that. I always ask her, I always ask her for advice because I'm trying to, I feel like I want to write some crazy music, some virtuosic stuff, but it's always, the more I know, the better before I start writing, because then I can make sure I avoid certain things. I just don't even go there in my head if I know it's going to be really a problem, but also just little things. String instruments are, are um, I feel like there's so many like things to learn just to help, to, just to make sure you write something that sounds natural and doesn't sound awkward and Cool. Well, I look forward to hearing the complete piece, hopefully in a live, in-person performance sometime. Someday, later. yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. So uh, let's go back to your uh, truths and lies that Emily uh, created about James. So uh, let's have people vote if you have not voted yet, but let's go ahead uh, and reveal one of the truths. Okay. Let's see. Um, so... It's true that I did uh, play the violin, and I quit twice. I played in second grade string orchestra and also in fifth grade. And I, I guess maybe in second grade I was just taking lessons. In fifth grade I was in the in the school orchestra, and I I just you know violin was I don't know what it was I just I wasn't very good at it. I was I it's I, I wish I could go back and figure out what exactly happened because I started clarinet. <laughs> the next year in sixth grade and I really liked it like from the beginning you know and you know a little bit like Emily uh my dad was a violinist and so I don't know if it's just that like I didn't want to copy my dad or something but I don't think that was it I just think a violin is it's so hard like you know where where are the notes like how do you find the notes and like clarinet something about the physicality you just blow in it and you put the friggin' button down and it you know the notes come out i mean i'm oversimplifying obviously but something about it just it just jive with me better well you should like give, it. you should give me a clarinet and see what comes out and you know <laughs> it's, it's you, because you make it sound so easy when you talk about it <laughs> uh, and okay and what's your other truth so the other truth was, you heard me mention a, a chamber music organization called Chatter. So Chatter, when it started um, in 2008, uh, well, there's a, it's a kind of a complicated story. Chatter was originally a new music group, kind of like Fear No Music. It's like there was the Fear No Music of Albuquerque. Um, uh, you know, it did um, uh, mostly contemporary stuff. And then that started 15, 16 years ago. And then about 10 or 11 years ago, something called the Church of Beethoven started up. And that was a Sunday morning performance series that continues to this day. Um, we're not performing now because of the current crisis, but um, uh, we've done like 600 shows, more depending on how you count it. Um, so we do every Sunday morning all year. And um, it's just kind of like a, like, a, like a humanist gathering that's centered around, we do poetry and music and we have a celebration of silence. Um, and it's just been awesome. It's been a really awesome community. We've played a lot of contemporary music, a lot of classical music, all types of stuff. And um, uh, we have about 200 people come every week and uh, it's it's really been an amazing experience. So yeah, the Church of Beethoven is uh, it's a, it's alive and well. Okay, so no baking for you? No, we've been baking a lot of cookies. Every night we bake cookies and uh, you know, and watch Netflix. We watch Netflix and eat, eat, eat cookies. It's, our, it's become our ritual. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. And uh, we're basically out of time, and I've had such a good time talking with you guys. There are a couple of things that I would still love to uh, uh, do with you guys, and one of them is our segment, Sound Advice. And what we do is we ask you guys, and maybe Emily will start with you, if you could travel back in time and find. 13 year old Emily Cole practicing in her room or at school or what advice would you have for her? You know, um, advice that I would give myself back then is actually, it's advice I, I try to, um, 
things I try to remember now, and it's, it speaks to a lot about um, kind of some fundamental things in my personality. It's, I, it, it's hard for me to take criticism, and it's important to be able to receive criticism when you play an instrument because your teacher or your orchestra director or person coaching your chamber music group is going to give you ideas to get better and they will give you assignments and things to do and if something is not if you're playing the wrong rhythm someone will tell you that and it's it's always been hard for me to kind of have um have a have kind of a I don't know what the what the right word is, but be able to to take in that feedback and not feel like I am a failure or that I am uh, never going to be any good or something like that. And that's something I really struggled with when I was younger. And I think that kind of perfectionism held me back from a lot of opportunities. I didn't. It, I was really uncomfortable with performing pieces unless I knew that they were just totally perfect. And I wish I could go back in time and kind of encourage myself to get out of my comfort zone a little bit and try new things and be okay with making mistakes and not having things be, you know, quite so perfect all the time. But yeah, those those are things I, I still have to, um, that I still wrestle with in my own playing. Thank you for Thank that, you. James. I, I mean, I think I would, I would say a lot of similar stuff, um, you know, like, when you play an instrument and you're practicing a lot, like, and you care about it, it's like, it becomes your voice. It becomes part of you. It's really, um, you know, if, if somebody criticizes you, even a teacher or something like that, I mean, sometimes it can feel like they're like saying that you're bad or you're whatever. I mean, and, um, and I think that's natural. I think it's really natural to feel that way. But I think one b big concept that I would try and impress upon myself, and I think it's similar to what Emily was saying was, you know, as much as like these ideas of like life is about the journey, not the destination, like they can seem cliche and stuff, but there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, I said a little bit earlier, like the better you get, the more you hear things you want to be better. You're never going to arrive at some point where it all feels good. And um, you have to just enjoy the process. And one thing I try and tell my students is just like set a goal for how much you're going to practice. And I think the only thing you should be hard on yourself about is whether or not you're paying attention while you're doing it. Because if you set a goal and you really apply your mind and you listen and you pay attention, eventually it's just gonna get better and get better and better and better. And you should just enjoy that, that process. It's kind of like something you just start in motion. And I don't even worry about where it ends up. I just try and make sure that I'm doing some practicing regularly. And I, and I always enjoy it, you know? It's, it's um, once, I, once I kind of take that expectation out of it to like that I have to get to a certain point and just just kind of try to hold myself to the expectation that I'm going to concentrate and that I'm going to try and be present um, you know of course I'm listening to recordings I'm listening to my colleagues I'm trying to figure out what sort of standards I should aspire to are I'm not you know I don't think you should do this in a vacuum you want you want to have some goals to go towards um, but just be okay with like not feeling like you ever really reach them and it's just part of the process one other specific thing, a little more specific thing, I would say, um, lately I've been thinking back on things my teachers told me that I kind of told myself, I don't really need to do it that way. I can do it a different way. And I think there's, a, I think it's okay to find your own way. I think it's important. I think you should explore it. But I would go back to my younger self and I would say, at least really try what they're saying, okay? Because I'm fixing stuff now about, for instance, in my case, it's my hand position, particularly my, my right hand hand position, where I'm just like, I'm just like, oh my gosh, so many people told me this, and there's just so many things would have been so much easier for so many years, for like 20 years, if I had just done what they said. You know what I mean? And it's, I know everyone's different. It's great. We should all try and find our own ways, but at least try and really try to do it the way that your teachers are saying, because it might save you a lot of pain and frustration over the years. So what you're saying basically is, MY students, listen to your orchestra conductors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and your teachers. Um, cool. And yeah, both of those uh, thoughts that you guys shared are things that we, you know, 
uh, as musicians and as constant students, because we're always students of music that we always have to remind ourselves of uh, in order, I think, to have a healthy relationship with our craft and with, with our growth. So thank you for sharing those thoughts. Our last little segment we called The Plug. So if you guys have anything you want to plug and, the, you know, if there are any online performances or anything you want to bring attention to, you have uh, now uh, the space to do that. Um, you know, we were we were talking before before this about just trying to remember if there was anything coming up that we could any any live streaming events. And we were kind of just thinking, you know, this is a really good opportunity to just kind of explore what's out there. All your favorite um, music groups in town, ensembles, are doing cool stuff online. Um, they may not be able to do live streams, but they may be posting videos. And it's it's a, it's a good time to kind of explore what's out there and also to, to look into, you know, you don't know much about the dance groups in town. If you want to learn more about, you know, ballet or, uh, modern dance, you know, with Body Box or White Bird. I'm sure they're doing really cool stuff online. There are tons of theater groups. This is a, a really good time to kind of give some social social media, YouTube boost to to groups around town, around the, and around the world and sort of use that opportunity to kind of expand your your own exper experience and let and let people who are out there making they're doing their still trying to do their craft know that people are tuning in and listening because it, it means a lot to those people to hear to hear from others yeah i mean at some point who knows when we're going to be back performing for live audiences um it's a lot of uncertainty right now um but one thing i do know for sure is that artists want to reach uh, get their art out to people they want to to reach people and make a difference and i think it's going to be a really interesting time um, and you know, Raul, you're you're doing a great thing right right here. We're 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 doing this right now. This is totally fun, and and I think a lot of different organizations are going to be experimenting right now because they have no other choice. And I think that's going to be really interesting. It's going to be fascinating to see what things come out of this time period that we kind of keep doing even once we can do live live concerts. I'm sure that some things uh, we're going to find out we really enjoy doing even without being forced into those situations. So I think it's going to be a really exciting time, and we don't know how long it's going to last, but sooner or later, um, we're going to be back performing uh, it, for, for live audiences. And in the meantime, it's going to be a really interesting period for experimentation. Yes. Well, thank you both so much for spending time with us uh, and being so generous with your time and with your performance. And I know that the two of you, along with your colleagues from the Oregon Symphony, are a constant source of inspiration for all of our students, but also to all of us working in you know, music performance and, and education in Portland and beyond. So thank you again. Um, I hope to see you guys in person soon. It'll happen. It's gonna happen. All right. And, uh, until then, thank you again. So I'll let you guys go now, and we'll we'll wrap the show. All right. See thank you. Take care. Bye. See you later. Okay. Thank you all for watching. Um, and yes, uh, go check out like uh, Emily and James were saying. Go check out all of these incredible offerings that are currently happening online from many different organizations but also support them financially if you're able. And then when things go back to normal, go to the shows, go to the concerts, um, be an active participant in the uh, cultural scene here in Portland and support your uh, arts organizations. So thank you. Maria, I'm sorry, I just saw your, your couple of questions for uh, Maria Garcia, you're watching. Uh, I missed your questions i'm sorry i apologize <laughs> uh but thank you all for watching uh tomorrow friday shuen cheng speaking of ballet uh will be our guest on the show uh she is a principal dancer with oregon ballet theater and we're preparing a little uh collaborative performance to show everybody during the show tomorrow then we're going to take a week off no no live streams next week but starting on may 5th we come back to our uh, uh, 
virtual hangout show weekdays at 4 p.m. with Norman Wynn, associate conductor of the Oregon Symphony. He's going to be our guest. Uh, Marilyn de Oliveira and Trevor Fitzpatrick from the Oregon Symphony on Thursday, April 7th. Susie and Nance, May, uh, sorry, May. That should be a five, not a four. And you know what? I'm going to fix it right now because I can. That should be, can you guys believe it's almost May? Anyways, and then uh, Suzanne Nance, Friday, May 8th at 4 p.m. Suzanne is, of course, the CEO and president of All Classical Portland. Uh, Darwin, great to hear from you, my friend. Good to, uh, good to see you in the comments. Glad you're watching. Thank you all for joining. See you tomorrow uh, for our Hangout with Xuan Cheng. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep practicing. See you later.